bridge. <laughs> you know? I mean, you know, Japan did claim to be a bridge between the East and the West in the early 20th century and uh, uh, in the second half of the 20th century also, but we're living in a more globalized world today, so I don't think that uh, the, uh, you know, like China or any other country needs to, uh, to be bound with a Japanese bridge with the rest of the world. <laughs> Uh, but I would like to begin with uh, by thanking the organizers and the sponsors of this uh, event. Uh, it's a very uh, great pleasure and honor for me to be here and be speaking uh, in front of this distinguished audience. I think my role is to provide a Japanese perspective uh, on this panel, but I'm not just going to focus on Japan, because, partly because Amb Ambassador Seth has already provided a, a good overview of uh, a Jap some of the Jap values that have influenced Japanese foreign policy, but also because uh, Japan is not a country which has a strong habit of uh, sort of exporting its own domestic uh, values outward. Uh, rather, historically, Japan has accepted worldviews uh, provided by larger and more advanced civilizations, China and India in the pre-modern era and West in the modern era, and have tried to sort of live within the uh, framework of that, uh, of a sort of an international order uh, built on the basis of those imported kind of worldviews. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, <clears throat> this doesn't mean that Japan does not have its own uh, distinctive values, culture, or civilization, but while um, preserving a highly developed sense of its own uh, uniqueness, Japan has usually refrained from trying to export its native cultural or religious values overseas. The only major exception to this generalization is the experience of the 1930s and 40s, which was not very popular, to put it mildly. So that has also confirmed Japan's inclination to adjust to global trends rather than to uh, try to export its domestic values overseas. So to understand the uh, configuration of values and interests uh, of, of international relations of contemporary East Asia, we need to uh, take a historical perspective and to see how the uh, East Asian historical experiences have shaped uh, the configuration of interests and values that we find in today's international relations. But the East Asia today, of course, is part of a globalizing world, so I need to begin with a sort of a, uh, a few remarks on the, uh, the, uh, the, the values that uh, have guided the liberal international order, which at least until very recently, uh, has been the sort of uh, defined the context in, in which East Asian states have existed. Although this is a ground that is very well covered in, by the, uh, the uh, speakers in the previous session, I think it's uh, useful to sort of divide the sort of uh, uh, leading norms that have guided the liberal international order into four successive layers that have been historically formulated on the basis of uh, the experiences uh, mostly of European and Western states. The first layer I would call sovereignty norms, which are designed to basically allow the sort of peaceful and more or less uh, a coexistence of uh, di uh, di diverse political entities. And uh, this developed from the 17th century and uh, it spread worldwide, partly because it has the capacity of allowing widely diverse political entities to coexist more or less stably, uh, in addition to, of course, imperi Western imperialism. Uh, but, uh, 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 but when this uh, uh, system was infused with the spirit of nationalism, this uh, system exploded in two devastating world wars in the early part of the 20th century, which leads to the uh, emergence of the second layer of these values, which I would call no, non-aggression norms, uh, which emerged after the First World War. I mean, this comprises things like uh, sort of uh, re respect for uh, territorial integrity of states, uh, the sort of peaceful resolution of international disputes, etc. And the third layer uh, I would call the liberal democratic norms. This developed separately from the sovereignty and non-aggression norms as noted by uh, some speakers in the previous panel, but this liberal democratic norms uh, achieved prominence in international society first during the, second, the First World War when Woodrow Wilson uh, claimed to make the world safe for democracy. And of course, after the Second World War, it became more widespread, even though it was not uh, accepted universally. The fourth layer, uh, which I would call postmodern uh, norms, uh, this became sort of uh, achieved increasing influence only after the Cold War, and this remains still controversial in uh, Western, liberal Western societies too. But East Asia has had a, a very different historical experience compared with the Western world. Uh, I think one of the uh, key distinctive characteristics of the uh, history of international relations in the West is the disintegration of a hierarchical imperial order by the early part of the 
uh, early modern period and uh, the emergence in its wake of a sort of an uh, international order that is based on the, pre uh, the principle of sovereign equality of states. By contrast, in East Asia, as you know, uh, Chinese empire, which is a universal empire, not unlike Rome, uh, persisted until the beginning of the 20th century. So, so for two millennia, international relations in Japan, in uh, the East Asian region was defined by hierarchical conceptions of international relations rather than a horizontal conception. And secondly, uh, the disintegration of the Sinocentric international order in East Asia did not lead to a uh, sort of a, uh, the reign of an equal sovereign state system. Of, as, of course, you're all familiar that uh, the crumbling, uh, superimposed on top of a crumbling Sinocentric order was an imperialist order in which only Japan uh, achieved a fully sovereign status and other East Asian states were subjected to Western and Japanese imperialism and colonialism. The collapse of third, the collapse of the Japanese Empire as a result of the Second World War did finally bring about a, an era of sovereign equality to international relations in East Asia. However, while sovereignty norms were deeply entrenched, uh, became deeply entrenched in uh, among East Asian states, the uh, liberal democratic norms and non-aggression norms were slower to take root in the region. This is partly because the Cold War. Uh, uh, generated two sets of, of divided states in East Asia, namely Korea and China, and in the relationships between these two states, two pairs of states, uh, non-aggression norms were not easily accepted. Between Taiwan and China, it's still not accepted, right? And the, as far as the liberal democratic norms was concerned, its spread, its reach in East Asia was limited to Japan until the 1980s. Uh, and finally, n number five, this, uh, um, I think one of the more important foundations of the development of a liberal international order in the Western world uh, in the second half of the 20th century was uh, restraint on nationalism, sentiments of nationalism. And you know, if you look at the history of uh, Western Europe and to some extent Japan, nationalism emerged during the 18th and 19th centuries, and it developed and culminated in the early part of the 20th century, but it, it resulted in devastating world wars, and to some extent, to, uh, West European countries and Japan also uh, uh, sort of learned from this, these experiences, and a more skeptical or more chastened view of nationalism became more influential in domestic politics. But Think about other East Asian states. They were not given a sort of chance for normal political development in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, so uh, it is quite natural that uh, the nationalism didn't go through the same, let's say, life cycle of growth and explosion and, you know, like reflection uh, as it did in Western Europe and Japan. So I think that more straightforward form of nationalism in many East Asian countries still retain a uh, greater degree of legitimacy and uh, uh, vibrancy in domestic politics. And uh, this along with, uh, and during the Cold War, the expression of Chinese and let's say Korean nationalism uh, were limited to some extent either by ideological for forces or by the uh, strategic uh, uh, exigencies of the Cold War. But since the end of the Cold War, it seems to me that uh, uh, nationalism in uh, China, as well as in Korea, have uh, taken a more uh, sort of classical form. And this, along with changes of political generation in Japan, is causing a lot of uh, troubles in the bilateral relations between Japan and China, J and Japan and Korea, more noticeably in uh, recent days. So, uh, um, of course, since the 1980s, um, since the 1980s, uh, the, uh, uh, it is true that liberal democratic values uh, spread to, to uh, South Korea and to Taiwan. And more importantly, uh, the, uh, sort of, uh, the capitalist world economy spread to China and to Russia also, uh, starting in the 1980s, with the result that, with the sole exception of North Korea, the entire East Asian region have become part of a liberal international order, in the, at least in the economic sense. But the hold of these liberal and democratic values in the East Asian region was rather tenuous to begin with. And what did globalization bring? Globalization, economic globalization in the past two, three decades have brought greater integration both within East Asia and greater integration of East Asian economies into the whole world economy. This is a kind of a positive factor. 
but it has also brought about a rapid rise in the sort of power of uh, sort of uh, uh, of states that are not necessarily uh, democratic or uh, liberal, and it has led to a general shift in uh, the balance of power between uh, sort of liberal Western states and uh, rising uh, sort of uh, countries, including authoritarian great powers. And that is one thing, and I think another important factor is that globalization brought about uh, sort of uh, um, culminated in this uh, uh, situation of, of a backlash that we're witnessing today. The uh, economic globalization and the uh, spread of postmodern values in Western societies have actually led to a deep division within Western liberal societies about the sort of the uh, vi viability of uh, of, uh, of a liberal international order. So I think we are in some ways going through what might be called a Polanyan moment in uh, international relations of the Western world. I mean, Karl Polanyi, of course, uh, wrote this uh, famous uh, work, The Great Transformation, in which he argued that the sort of 19th century liberal civilization was unique in human history and sort of uh, uh, placing the market economy at the very center of the social fabric and subordinating all other aspects of human endeavor to the central uh, sort of demands of the economic rationality, but this was profoundly disturbing and unsettling kind of uh, approach to organizing society, which led to radical reactions in the form of fascism and communism, etc. I'm not suggesting that fascism and communism will, will raise their head again in today's world, but we are kind of, uh, I think we are kind of experienced going through a uh, mini uh, Polanyan moment. And so the return to a liberal international order that existed prior to the, all the crises that happened uh, is not likely. I think we need a uh, sort of a, a lot of recalibration of the liberal Western societies before there, these uh, countries will uh, find a more confidence in the sort of path that they're taking. And that is also going to, whether that is going to happen will also uh, have a, a great impact on uh, East Asian international relations. Another factor that will impact uh, the, uh, that will have a lot of impact on uh, shape international relations in East Asia is uh, uh, how we can manage the uh, forces of nationalism in East Asia. As I mentioned uh, before, uh, nationalism in East Asia remains a kind of more vibrant and uh, uh, yes, force in, uh, uh, compared with some uh, Western countries, at least until fairly recently. And it is quite natural for countries which have suffered from colonialism and imperialism in the past to uh, want to uh, remove the painful memories of the past and to, uh, uh, to recover their historical glory, real or imagined. But uh, the, as the experience of Japan in the early part of the 20th century indicates, there's obviously the, the danger of these uh, aspirations uh, sort of uh, misfiring and uh, sort of creating havoc in the international order. So I think that uh, a large portion of the shape of international relations in the East Asian region hinges first on whether the Western world will be able to find the kind of, uh, uh, of uh, judicious kind of political leadership which will allow itself to recalibrate a liberal international order in a way that achieves uh, a new kind of equilibrium within itself and it also depends on, on um, the uh, degree to which East Asian states, including Japan itself, can manage its own nationalist sentiments uh, in such a way that the national aspirations of East Asian states will end up contributing to the uh, international cooperation rather than unilateral actions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Anno. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have about 15 or 20 minutes, so the floor is open. You've heard three very interesting presentations, very diverse. Yes, Ambassador Dasgupta. I, I would like very briefly to refer to an East Asian or Asian contribution to, uh, to international uh, values or ideals and to use that to reflect on the relationship between national interests and ideals. 
So uh, the principle of racial equality, non-discrimination on grounds of race, it was Japan which first proposed this in 1919 at the Treaty of Versailles. This was strongly opposed by President Vincent because he had the question of racial discrimination in his own country in mind. Uh, he's been falsely accused of excessive idealism uh, and also by Britain. And between these two, they managed to prevent the adoption of the Japanese proposal, even though when put to vote, it had majority support because a number of European countries, such as France and Italy, supported the Japanese proposal. Now, this was revived in 1945, when the San Francisco Treaty was being brought up. And in the lead of that was Ramaswamy Mudala, who represented British India at that time. Uh, his proposal was to introduce an article in the charter which would guarantee racial equality. This was voted down. The whole thing had been anticipated, of course, by the British Foreign Office and the Americans in 1944. And so this was brought under a clause which brings in non-discrimination on various grounds, but including race. So it figures there. And the calculation was that the provision for sovereignty and non-interference in domestic affairs would override the uh, non-discrimination on racial grounds clause. So when South Africa was brought up, that was the defense which was originally taken. Okay, now, um, so this is an Asian contribution, if you like, to current values. But now, if you are to uh, uh, look at the origins of this idea, did it arise from some Japanese value involving Taoism or, uh, or a Chinese value you know, originating from Confucianism or from the India's Manusmriti? No, it arose from a common interest, which was opposition to Western domination at that period of time. So the point I'm trying to make is that ideals often arise from interests. They are not permanent, you know, sort of uh, traditional factors which remain unchanged. Sometimes there are, but very frequently, we have to examine the, the interrelationship between ideals and interests at any given historical stage. Thank so, you. So no permanent interests or permanent ideals? Right. Anybody would like to comment on this? Afat, Mr. Wong? Sure. Would, yeah? Maybe I will. Uh, okay. uh, you go ahead, Anusan. Uh, thank you for that uh, comment and question. Yes, I, I completely agree. I mean, uh, the, uh, uh, the, as far as the uh, racial uh, equality clause in 1919 was concerned, uh, well, I mean, Japan was itself accused of uh, sort of discriminating against Koreans and Taiwanese within the Japanese empire. So. Uh, J Japanese hands were not clean, and uh, I mean, obviously Japan was uh, trying to sort of uh, uh, improve its stance vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other uh, Western great powers in advancing that. So uh, this was uh, a transparent, in some ways, uh, attempt to sort of uh, advance Japanese national interests as well as you know, advancing a sort of a, at least on the surface universalistic principle, but uh, to, to some extent those universalistic principles become entrenched in international sort of society, partly through those uh, self-interested kind of initiatives. So uh, I think we have to also look at the long-term consequences of these uh, sort of uh, ideas, uh, 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 in addition to the origins of where they came from, yes. Thank you. Uh, I was uh, wanting uh, to uh, pose a couple of uh, points to our Chinese colleague uh, who uh, mentioned about common values, humanity, and benefit of mankind. Now, how does that reconcile with the uh, concept of the Middle Kingdom and a hierarchical world order which the last speaker had also alluded to. Secondly, uh, does not 
egalitarianism abroad imply a liberal and well, it implies a liberal and democratic world order, but how does that become compatible with authoritarianism uh, domestically? And a general point, uh, uh, actually struck that uh, while there are sessions on uh, values in foreign policies of different regions, I didn't find any session on values in Indian foreign policy. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wang, would you like to take that? Okay. Yeah, you just see your microphone. Just, yeah, just, yeah. Uh, traditional China, you say, we hierarchy, all on the heaven. We are the center. We are civilizational culturally. Uh, but today we say share value, common values, definitely is not that case. It's a global village, as I said. It's uh, from a traditional China to modern China, now global China. I think they are global Britain, global Asia, global India, global Japan maybe. I think that, that's more more globalized. That's what we uh, definitely uh, try to contribute to the shared or common values for the humankind in a globalized world. I think that's the, not a contradict. Uh, secondly, you talk about the liberal democratic order. Yes, liberal democratic order. Uh, but uh, for instance, in the internet, uh, only four countries, they have their own search in India. Uh, Google, Chinese Baidu, uh, Russians, uh, Yandex, and uh, South Korea. If you don't have your own uh, search in India, uh, if you don't have the uh, independent uh, industrial system, and, uh, and then you just be being Googleized, that's the uh, Snowden case told you, this liberal it actually is affiliated to the who provided the public goods for you. So this is not equal. So we, we, are, we, we are like the liberal order, but I think that should on the base of the sovereignty, on the base of the autonomies of every nations. And then the, you have your own uh, industrial system, you, uh, have your own, uh, other, you can have your own sovereignty in the internet. That's, I think, the preconditions. So, so that in this regard, we are not against that. And then about and there's no permanent values. So the Chinese think uh, maybe they, uh, they, they have, uh, because we all like the one. Uh, the Tao produce one, one produce two, three, and then everything began. Okay, there's one, but not the original one. Uh, so we, we think about the values should be renovated, should be created. So that reason, many Western don't understand. Everything Chinese uh, diplomats say, Confucian say that, Confucian say that, Tao didn't say that. So they're, they're confused. Why the 2,000 years ago, an old man told you about what you should do today about today? So Confucianism is more and more central, uh, uh, culturalized, localized, and modernized. It's not just the originally what the Confucian said before. Right, right. So that's very important, I think. Sure. Okay? okay? So I think in the interest of time, we'll take a few questions together. Uh, the gentleman here in the middle, then Rajiv uh, Bhatia, and then the lady. Yes, yeah, I, and I, briefly, I, please, all of you. I'll yeah. be as brief as I can. Yes, please. University teacher can't be. No, you I really have to be, to be because we're be. all really hungry. <laughs> I try to be. Yeah, okay. Now, my, my question is not going to be particularly pleasing to my Japanese friends. Uh, and this is a comment again. I'm afraid that there is very little traditional inheritance of Japanese culture that it has been able to globalize in any significant sense. Okay. Uh, it has imitated extremely well, exceptionally well, and I occasionally compare them with our uh, Sardarjis in India. They're great I, I, imitators. Yeah, okay, right. They, in other words, when Meiji restoration takes place, you know, it is all imitating Western army they send to uh, Germany to modernize, Navy they so send So you'll to have to, I'm Britain really... Britain to modernize. You'll have yes, to... I, um, I'll just complete, don't... Make it like an anchor person in Well, I'm afraid we, you know, there's lots of questions and we'll have all to take right, all I'll of them. I'll be as brief. Okay. In other words, it, it imitated colonialism and colonized a country like China, which was the source of its civilizational resources. China to Japan is like Greece and Rome to Europe. It imitated, it took its religion from India. It took its culture from, uh, civilizational resource from China. Right. So as a consequence, it has three gods, okay. I found. Yeah. Shintoism, when a child is born, they go to, when a they get married, they go to a church. When they, someone is dead, they go to a Buddhist temple. And all this explains why 
from any other constitution, the MacArthur Constitution of 1945 is best replicated among the East Asian societies in Japan. It has liberal democracy, capitalism, and everything that is Western and very little that is Japanese for itself and for the rest of the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I have a question for Ambassador after upset, uh, uh, and this is about the values in Japanese foreign policy. These values that you have described emanating from three religions or philosophies led to the greatness of Japan in many, many fields. Uh, but then uh, time came and Japan also uh, tried to drag uh, Asia in the direction of unipolarity through fascism, militarism, wars. So can uh, we say that those very values were also responsible for the ugliness of Japan once upon a time? Uh, you said that there was nothing specifically Japanese and that everything was a Western import. This is only partially true because Japan has taken a lot from China, of course, and from other countries, but it has refined and made far more sophisticated in many ways the imports that have come in. And I, I say this about pottery, I say it about the tea ceremony, I say it about silk, uh, various other things which are very traditional and very Japanese. And through the Japan Foundation, uh, which has, you know, uh, like your Confucius Institutes, very aptly named, the Japan Foundation does try and promote these finer, more sophisticated, more refined aspects of Japanese culture, which are, you know, uh, things which have come in from outside. That's for you. For you, Rajiv, um, yes, uh, the initial enlightenment which came in through Fukuzawa Yukichi, the, the modernizer of uh, modern Japan, started off with being just that. He wanted to import all the enlightenment of Europe into Japan. And the Meiji constitution uh, made such attempts to bring in a liberal kind of, of, of uh, democracy grafted onto basically the Shinto emperor and the emperor at the center. What happened later is that there were infirmities in the constitution which permitted, uh, which was designed to rule the country and not the empire which Japan began to acquire. They aped the West. They felt actually, in many ways, encircled and deprived. Uh, that that w just when they were coming into power, the West was teaching them through Woodrow Wilson's 14 points about how important it was to be noble and, and not uh, uh, exploit people and so forth. So it was their sense of deprivation, their sense of being encircled, which caused them to move outwards, A, against uh, China, and then uh, w in their colonization of Korea, and then, of course, the, the defeat of uh, Russia in, uh, in, in, in 1905, which really catapulted Japan into the world class. And even the British recognized it by their treaty of 1902. They recognized the fact that Japan was a power. Yes, the values of Japan called for muscularity. This is very much a part of Japanese culture. So a lot of what they did in building an empire was an expression of this muscularity. You saw it go down in the immediate post-war years, 1945 onwards. But there was a recrudescence again 
in the time of Koizumi in 2001, this muscularity which Abe has taken well forward. So what you were referring to about the ugly aspects of Japan's foreign policy is part of this very important value of muscularity. I don't know if Anno-san will agree with me or not. Uh, with regard to the question of whether you know this Japanese sort of fascism and uh, sort of expansionism in the 30s and 40s reflect uh, sort of Japanese uh, Shintoism and stuff like that, I have to say that uh, all kinds of cultural resources available at the time were sort of mobilized in service of justifying the Japanese war effort in the 30s and 40s. Of course, Buddhism, Shintoism, but even Christianity was kind of uh, mobilized in support of Japanese war effort. But I think that. Shintoism was, was in a position to be particularly closely linked with the sort of Japanese expansionist effort. But I would say that this is a kind of a uh, sort of anomaly in Japanese history because, I mean, Shintoism is a strictly ethnic religion that was really not for export. I mean, the, they did build Shinto shrines where the Japanese colonized, but uh, this was not a religion that was built for export. Think about the Japanese creation myth as developed in Kojiki, the classic Japanese text. It, it is a creation myth, but that talks only about the emerge, how the Japanese archipelago was created. It doesn't talk about how Korea was created, how China was created. You know, that's what I was talking about when I was saying that Japan has imported world views from the outside world. And the only thing that was distinctively Japanese was about Japan itself, which was always seen as a some, somewhat of uh, uh, something of an exception in a sort of otherwise uh, alien world. So I think that you know this uh, 19, the experience of 30s and 40s was a sort of a uh, uh, anom anomaly from the view, viewed from the uh, sort of tradition of Japan's longstanding, uh, the way Japan has uh, related to the outside world. I just want to say something very quickly about values, uh, especially in foreign policy. I had always imagined that values were based on success stories. At least most, uh, most countries are looking for success. And they look at certain societies, nobody knows why certain societies succeed more than others at certain times. And then they would look into these societies and look for the seeds of change or value. Could, can the panel just talk about uh, how in foreign policy values are not really driven by cultural changes as we've established? Because cultures do change. China changes culture under Mao. So would they not be driven by success stories in certain societies? Nobody can tell when or why this happens. Perhaps you would like to comment on that. Right. So uh, we'll take your question along with the last one. Yes, Ambassador Trigunath. Oh, there is another one at the back. OK. Go ahead, Ambassador. Uh, my question is essentially to Mr. Wang. And Jyoti, it is your question which you started with in the first place. We are talking of values, ideals, and interests. Uh, you probably rightly mentioned that uh, Confucius' ideas are confusing to the ordinary mind outside. Uh, I'm unable to understand, and perhaps you can deliberate on it. Uh, we will bring back the question of Masood Azhar and the terrorism. You said China is against the terrorism. We have seen all kinds of statements coming out of China. What I'm unable to understand is the same organization like Jashir Muhammad has been proscribed by the United Nations in which you were part of it. But you continue to protect the leader of that organization who's claimed to have carried out attacks, terrorist attacks in India. Now, is it the value or ideal or it is simply the interest? Okay, and the last question at the back, please. Hello, hello. Uh, my question is to Professor Wang Yi. Uh, so when you're talking about okay. China... I'm, I'm sorry, can you tell us who you are? Uh, my name is Paul Ding, and I'm from Institute of Peace and Conflict Studies in okay. Delhi. Thank you. Uh, my question is, so when you're talking about the, uh, China, which is globalizing, especially uh, President Xi Jinping's Bay Road Initiative and the idea of a community of shared destiny, all this globalized idea. At the same time, we have also President Xi Jinping, who is intolerant towards different ideas, especially uh, democratic ideas, and he's basically 
a kind of burning a firewall in which the other ideas cannot penetrate inside China. How can we reconcile between this one in which there's one Xi Jinping who is talking about globalizing community of shared destiny, at the end of this, another Xi Jinping who is not so much in front of, you know, about other ideas sharing with the other people. Right, thank you so much. Questions directed to you, Mr. Wong. The first one is uh, you say culture always change, so there's no values in a foreign policy. Yes, cultural uh, change, uh, very diverse, but civilization not. DNA not. For instance, when the, uh, the J Russia occupied uh, Crimea, uh, you know, to that time, many people say, Chinese say, oh, we should do sand, you know, Taiwan, blah, blah, blah. But China didn't. That's different uh, DNA, I think, right? Even we have more power to do that. Different DNA authority. from Russia? Legitimate. Huh? Different DNA from? From Russia. Okay. Okay. Second, uh, about uh, China protect terrorists, uh, Pakistan, something. I don't think so. You have the case to a testament to show this. Uh, I think China support Pakistan to fight against terrorists, definitely. And the Pakistan government, as I said, no sovereign authority to do whatever in you know, control the situation, and they make some troubles even uh, across the border. We know each other. You also cross the border up to sometimes, and then the uh, so that's reason I think uh, uh, that's a common problem for us, not just the uh, China uh, Pakistan bilateral. And certainly, Xi Jinping not support other. Values or something. I, I don't think this. Um, we say centralism, about democratic centralism. That is our guiding principles. We should respect all the different uh, values, but we need centralized because China is so big and uh, so complex. So we have respect the different voices, but you can have the right to talk to to, to same. But according to the Chinese law, you should uh, uh, do. Uh, uh, I think not violating the legitimacy of the Communist Party because the Chinese constitution says very clearly the People's Republic of China was under the leadership of the Communist Party. So who against the Communist Party leadership is who against the constitution of the PRC. And then you answer the rule of law. This is the fundamental rule of law. Right. So, uh, Atta, would you like to uh, comment on uh, the lady's question, which is that... Sure. I don't know. If no, this no, is, no, I don't know. This yes, is it is working now. It is. This is working. Okay. This is working. Um, I had mentioned uh, Rajiv Bhatia actually mentioned the the success. What you talk about the success? It was that the success of the Western powers in establishing colonial empires, which egged the Japanese on to follow the, follow suit. And they felt deprived when they were prevented from doing this. Uh, they felt deprived and encircled. And in fact, they found th the fact that they had internalized a lot of the Western Christian value system, even when Matsuoka led Japan out of the League of Nations in 1933, because Japan was castigated for what they were doing in China, uh, and elsewhere, he walked out saying that like Jesus Christ, Japan has been crucified by world opinion. So that is the psyche which influenced Japan during those interwar years. They had a liberal, a liberal bit, you know, before the First World War and during uh, the Versailles, which uh, Sheikh had mentioned uh, the business about anti-racism and so on. But then after that, the military got control, uh, higher control, and subverted uh, Japanese foreign policy into more muscular directions. Uh, I think that the uh, uh, ambassador is uh, uh, right about uh, sort of uh, masculine and 
uh, martial virtues uh, having a very strong influence on Japanese foreign policy from the Meiji to the Second World War. And I think that uh, the question about the sort of uh, uh, the notion that uh, values are sort of confirmed or disconfirmed by success or lack thereof is very much true. I mean, you know, Japan is a country which hasn't been used to sort of projecting its own domestic values outward. So basically, it was all about adjusting to the exist, uh, prevailing international environment and achieving success in it. And the Meiji Japanese state was quite successful in uh, adjusting to the sort of uh, norms and standards of the age, partly because of J Japan's mar own martial tradition, but the success in doing so confirmed Japan's pride as a military great power, which it kept until the Second World War. But you know, Japan also learned from the devastating experience of the defeat in the Second World War. And so even though we can observe some sort of recrudescence of Japanese nationalism under Koizumi and especially under Abe, I think uh, that it would be sort of uh, probably not entirely accurate to characterize uh, the current Japanese society in the same manner as uh, the pre-war Japanese society. I mean, after all, this is a country where in the, in the World Values Survey, you know, like uh, when uh, Japanese respondents were asked uh, if they are willing to fight for Japan if your country is attacked by military force by another country, only 15% of the Japanese people said yes. And this is uh, based on the assumption that your country is actually under attack. Uh, uh, on the other hand, not too many people said we're not going to fight, you know, but uh, a large portion of Japanese people are taking this position of strategic ambiguity. We don't know. <laughs> but uh, current Japanese society is very different from pre-war Japanese society. That I can assure you. Yes. Thank you so much, Anosan, Ambassador Aftab Seth, and Mr. Wong. Three fascinating civilizations on my table, ladies and gentlemen, China, India, and Japan. Thank you so much, all of you. A big hand to my panelists. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Uh, we have a short message from Tata Trust. I may invite uh, Ms. Pooja Parvati, Manager, Policy and Advocacy. Good afternoon. Uh, very privileged to be collaborating with ICREA on this uh, extremely important uh, initiative project. Uh, for Tata Trust, making a sustainable difference in the lives of the most marginalized has been our guiding vision. And uh, historically, the trusts have been supportive and promoted, fostered uh, nation building, institution building, and working and uh, strengthening communities by way of uh, working on important areas of focus such as education, health, agriculture, rural livelihoods. Apart from that, of course, it's also been an extreme uh, important area of focus for the Trust to uh, work and uh, develop scholarship research around key areas of focus, be it uh, our collaborations with institutions, educational uh, institutions, academic bodies, as well as with the, uh, you know, on areas that require a focus on foreign policy, strategic relations. Uh, for instance, our engagement and our collaborations with the Institute of Chinese Studies, NCAR, and now ICRIAR. So um, without any further ado, just to welcome you all again and uh, wish you a long, uh, interesting uh, conversations today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you for the message. Uh, we would now break for lunch at uh, Patio towards your left, outside, and resume with the diplomatic guest lecture at uh, 2.15. And uh, if you are leaving the hall, please return well before uh, 2.15 so that uh, we can start off. Thank you.